Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled Treating Co-Occurring Disorders with Equine Assisted Psychotherapy. I'm Gary Enos, editor of Addiction Professional Magazine. Today's program has been sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network. Thank you to our sponsor and to you and our audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping details. Each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging or enlarged and minimized by clicking the icons in the top right corner of each window. Please use the Q&A area below the slides to submit a question at any time during the presentation. If you cannot see this area, simply click the red Q&A button. To download a copy of today's slides, please click the link in the resources area in the bottom left of your screen. If you have any technical issues during this program, please click the yellow Help button to troubleshoot the issue. For those seeking CE credit, certificates will be distributed via the green CE certificate button at the end of today's program, so please wait for further instructions at the conclusion of today's event. You can also tweet during today's presentation via the Twitter widget by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click the Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing at the hashtag AP Equine Therapy. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Patrick Dunn. Patrick holds a master's degree in counseling psychology and is in the dissertation phase of a PhD in psychology. He has researched, studied, and practiced equine-assisted psychotherapy for several years. He has worked with both adolescents and adults in the field of substance abuse, psychological disorders, and trauma recovery. He practices and has trained others in a variety of experiential therapy techniques and believes in the benefit of using horses in the healing process. Patrick also has spent more than 10 years working with adults and adolescents in a therapeutic environment and carries a number of certifications, including Seven Challenges, Recovery Dynamics, and EGALA, among others. Patrick believes in supporting and empowering clients to confront fears, overcome obstacles, and reach their goals. He also presents to professional counseling groups and organizations on experiential techniques, solution-based approaches, and identifying trauma survivors. Patrick has a private practice in Nashville, Tennessee, and offers mobile equine services in Tennessee and surrounding areas. Thank you, Patrick, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah, great introduction. Um, yeah, uh, like Gary said, um, you know, I do believe in uh, equine-assisted psychotherapy. And the reason I do is because two things. It works and it's simple, you know, and from uh, working with co-occurring disorder from a range of uh, clientele over the years, uh, you know, I was, I've always been looking for a, a, a solution-based kind of a therapeutic model that works and that can meet people where they're at uh, because with co-occurring disorder, everybody is at such a different, um, not only diagnoses, but, you know, but symptoms, where they are in their therapeutic process, the motivation. And so I was really uh, looking for something when I find, uh, you know, equine therapy, something that can really meet people where they're at in different stages. Um, so I was very glad to find it. Like Gary said, I use uh, equine therapy here in uh, Nashville. Uh, I'm trained in and certified in the EGALA model. Uh, and if a little bit longer in the presentation, uh, I'll give you some resources to look at that. But the EGALA model is a a simple, uh, you know, model that is focused on using the horse as a, a co-therapist and brief uh, solution-focused therapy. So really focusing on empowerment, focused on, uh, you know, motivation, support, all the things that we know um, are successful uh, in therapy. So we started off with the poll question. Uh, I want to get everybody's initial uh, kind of, you know, idea or conception of equine therapy. And the poll question is, what is your knowledge of experiential equine therapy and the application of it with the, popula with the population you work with? Give you guys a free moment to uh, check that. And uh, 
when I say uh, experiential equine therapy, equine-assisted psychotherapy, I kind of use those terms uh, back and forth. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go look at the results. Okay. So it, it looks like uh, there's definitely uh, room to grow and room to uh, learn more, uh, as well as having some people that look uh, pretty experienced in the field. So, you know, I know for me, uh, you know, I put the, the question as two parts, um, the knowledge of experiential equine therapy, but also the second part, which is the application of it. Because I know for me, uh, you know, knowledge is not as useful unless I know how to use it with the population I work with. And like I said earlier, with, uh, you know, experiential equine therapy, equine-assisted psychotherapy, um, the application, um, is, it, it comes very, very simple and very useful. The goals of this program um, are going to be uh, introduction to co-occurring disorders, co-occurring disorder treatment. So just kind of understanding, which I'm sure everybody has a pretty general knowledge of what it is, but you know also what's kind of going on right now. Uh, introduction to experiential therapy and experiential equine therapy. I wanted to look at experiential therapy first because uh, you know I've seen especially over this last kind of decade experiential therapy really kind of move into uh, you know the forefront of you know being very very useful and really creating a lot of uh, growth uh, with a wide range of clients so first I want to look at kind of the conception and theory uh, experientially and then look at that and how that transitions into experiential equine therapy and of course the application of uh, experiential equine techniques with this type of population. Integration of experiential equine techniques, techniques with traditional therapies and resources uh, where we can, you can find more about it, uh, local resources and how you can really use this or at least try it out to see if it'll be beneficial for you. Now on the fourth program goal, um, you know, <clears throat> from my experience and I speak purely from, from my experience on everything, is that, you know, a lot of times there can be a lot of useful, uh, you know, modalities of therapies, but, you know, until you're really being able to bring them all together, you know, with the client, um, sometimes they can, you know, sometimes they can struggle or even get confused. So from my experience working in residential treatment, um, I'm always looking for stuff to pull everything together, you know really kind of bring everything together so clients can, you know, easily kind of move forward and understand. Co-occurring disorder. Have some definitions. Any two or more behavioral health disorders experienced by the same person at the same time. Um, most of the time, I'd say the majority of the time, we're talking about uh, an SMI or serious mental illness, mental illness and substance abuse. Um, I know there you know, co-occurring, it can be any two, but most of, you know, my experience is going to be substance abuse and a mental disorder. So um, struggling in using substances or the effects from using a lot of substances is the way I see it. You can also be called a dual diagnosis or a dual disorder. I think the uh, technical term now is, uh, or the appropriate term is co-occurring. Um, an example, and probably uh, one of the most prevalent examples is bipolar disorder and substance abuse. Most common co-occurring disorders. Uh, just some statistics. Uh, pretty much, that's saying what we're looking at is about half. About half of the people that present um, with a serious mental illness um, also have a substance abuse disorder. And the first one talks about 41 to 65 percent of people with a lifetime substance abuse disorder also having a serious mental illness. So, uh, by approximating, I'm saying we're looking about half of these people that we're treating uh, with substance abuse, you know, has that co-occurring disorder. You know, not that they know it, not that it's been you know diagnosed before, but looking at on average, we're looking about half of the people that you know I'm treating or working with in my field, you know have more than one disorder, which definitely makes it hard to treat and hard to uh, understand. Some of the possible mental health disorders that co-occur with substance abuse 
and I just put a list of uh, the major things we work with, bipolar, borderline, depression, anxiety, PTSD, schizophrenia, ADD, pretty new to the list, sexual disorder, and gambling. So when you look at it, uh, for me, knowing before when looking for useful techniques to use, um, you know, working with borderline or bipolar, I mean, if it's not challenging enough, um, when you throw, uh, you know, abusive substances in the mix, uh, it makes it very difficult. Why is it difficult? I think we probably know, but assessment, um, and when I say assessment, I'm referring to the inability to kind of decipher is, you know, is this, is this, uh, are these symptoms due to substance abuse? You know, is this, uh, say, um, lethargia or, you know, inability to be motivated? Is this from, uh, you know, chronic marijuana smoking or is this from depression? You know, so being able to assess, uh, you know, correctly is a difficult uh, treatment planning. Being able to decide uh, what to work on and when to work on it. Um, you know, should we uh, tackle this first? Should we tackle that first? You know, and from my experience in the residential treatment field, you know, the window of opportunity to treat somebody is very short, you know, so appropriate treatment planning is very important. And then implementing that plan, uh, you know, is this plan going to be workable? You know, or is this client going to be able to work this plan? Identification of symptoms, uh, also with assessment, but when you talk about self-reporting, um, you know, somebody with co-occurring disorder might not even know, uh, you know, what the symptoms are or, you know, how it relates to anything else. Uh, lack of effective short-term intervention, interventions. And so, you know, once again, from working in residential treatment, the window is very small. So looking for very engaging, uh, you know, therapeutic models that have a wide range of uh, being able to use them that meet a, a you know, array of people. And the variety of clients in a group setting, uh, when you're talking about co-occurring disorder, uh, you know, the slide before we talked about all the different combinations, all the different possibilities of mental illness, or, uh, you know, as we know, different substances affect people differently. Um, so the variety of uh, clients that you could have in a group. What doesn't work? And when I say what doesn't work, I'm talking about from, from my experience. And so the things that I have struggled with using. So it might not be the model, but it's my application of model that really hadn't worked that, much, worked that well. Traditional substance abuse or treatment. Now, traditional substance abuse or treatment, um, from my experience, I'm talking recovery dynamics, uh, kind of a 12-step model, you know, but where I have struggled uh, working with that is with the co-occurring disorder. You know, it hasn't been able to um, kind of reach or kind of understand, you know, the complexity of dealing with the, the multitude of problems, whereas a uh, uh, you know, an abstinence kind of behavior modi modification model can address it uh, with co-occurring disorder. Usually there's just a lot more, you know, irons in the fire. Uh, co-occurring disorder and the multitude of characteristics, um, such as, from my experience, talk therapy, psychoanalytic, cognitive behavior therapy, whereas all those are very useful, very evidence-based useful therapies, um, you know, my experience is there's just too much going on uh, and there's too short of a span um, for that to be, you know, a, a consistent, uh, you know, effective therapy in, in the brief setting. And not treating symptoms that concurrently. Most of the research uh, recently shows that an integrated method um, treating, you know, both, the, both uh, you know, parts of the co-occurring at the same time has been the most useful method uh, of treating co-occurring disorder. Uh, and I just threw some really big words in here, monotherapeutic pharmacology, and that's just using meds and nothing else, um, whereas medication for uh, a depression or medication um, for some other, uh, you know, diagnoses, using that so solely with co-occurring disorder is not going to be able to treat all the aspects of it as it might in something else. And short-term treatment without ongoing therapeutic support. I mean, we, we, we all know that, you know, the longer somebody is getting services, the better chance they have to stay in recovery. But also, 
um, you know, ongoing support environment because with co-occurring disorder, the symptoms are not just going to go away. Um, you're probably going to experience symptoms for a longer period of time and continually need more support. What does work? An integrated approach. Activities that engage clients. One of the hardest things I have found working with co-occurring is the inability to engage clients because if we can't engage them, we can't do any work. Client empowerment. Um, you know, there's a thin line between uh, doing the work for somebody and having them do it for itself, but really focus on how can I empower this person to do their work. Solution-based approach, that is putting clients in a situation where they come up with their own solutions. Group activities, motivational interviewing, we know from substance abuse treatment that is a very useful uh, approach, and experiential therapy. And part of experiential ther therapy is learning from the metaphors that come up doing the therapy. Uh, and this is just some resources. An integrated approach occurring dis co occurring disorder is shown to be the most beneficial approach. And this is a good, uh, from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, you know, combining, um, you know, psychiatric treatment and addiction treatment um, lowers the rate. So that is, you know, same with the integrated method, combining those, uh, you know, forces of treatment to be able to uh, be more useful. Uh, quick definitions, experiential therapy. Therapy, as we know, treatment, psychotherapy, healing power, quality. Experiential therapy, relating to or derived from experience. Um, so that is having someone experience what's going on and they learn from their experience of that. Uh, whereas before, I know with substance abuse treatment um, and your traditional kind of 12-step recovery dynamic model is you can learn from, you know, my experience, but, you know, when we go deeper into that, you know, people really you know, almost deserve to learn from their own experience. And if they can experience that, then they can make metaphors and they can learn from that. So that's probably the quickest definition of experiential therapy you ever heard. Sharon uh, Weisager Cruz, this is a uh, great experiential therapy is a treatment approach that combines theory with action. It is technique therapists can use to touch people's lives deeply and intimately. Its effect can be profoundly healing. Treatment is a combination of knowledge and experience. To utilize one without the other is incomplete therapy. You know, and I know for me, that is what I'm trying to do with clients. I'm trying to them to use their knowledge and their experience together to be able to, be able to make better decisions in their lives. Uh, background, um, this is just the, the three main branches and we'll talk about it uh, rather quickly. Um, psychoanalysis, as we know, Freud, um, otherwise known as the, the father um, of psychology or, or psychotherapy, uh, and we have, and it breaks off into behavioral and psychodynamic. Behavioral, um, learning from kind of observation, uh, psychodynamic, learning from question asking, and humanistic, you know, and that is where I really think that uh, you know, therapy and psychology kind of branched out to the direction that I feel more comfortable with, that, that holistic um, kind of avenue, the self-actualization that, you know, believing, empowering, and supporting someone can allow them to come up with their own solutions. And more than anything else, when I talk about the model of equine therapy that I feel more comfortable with, um, you know, it's that humanistic kind of belief that, you know, if people can get to it, they can come up with their own answers and, you know, and beliefs and motivation to you know, almost heal themselves. And this is my uh, favorite uh, kind of slide when it comes to experiential learning, the cone of learning. Um, and I know for me uh, this has been very useful. Uh, I'm not good listening to lectures in front of class never was, um, just didn't really retain that information. And so the current learning, cone of learning talks about how we learn. And at 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, uh, but when you go all the way down to 90% of what they do. So 
when I think about experiential therapy, I think about getting people into that active learning zone where they are doing, you know. And if they're doing, they're engaging, they're using both sides of their brain, they're, you know, stuff's coming up, and they're, they're learning, you know. And when you, when you give them solution-based exercises, they're kind of engaged and they're figuring out um, how to do the solution that's in front of them, but really what they're doing is practicing on how to make these solutions for in their lives. All right. Experiential therapy goals. Moves towards the development of the whole person. Um, you know, a lot of people would say that it's, you know, people you reach out for support because they get blocked off from being able to connect with others. So experiential therapy is allowing people to understand and believe that they can connect with others and connect with themselves, development of the whole person. The uh, four parts, cognitive, emotional, behavioral, spiritual. And so, you know, learning uh, about oneself, uh, the, the goal would be for me is to get somebody to a place of balance, you know, to get not only making decisions based on cognitive or emotional, you know, but making decisions by taking all kind of parts of you uh, in together to make kind of a congruent, kind of balanced person. And then a goal would be to help clients rework those developmental stages that they might be stuck in by re-experiencing and practicing in a safe therapeutic environment. Why and how of experiential therapy. So for me... Some of the roadblocks that I found uh, with other forms why I really think experiential therapy has been useful with the population I work with, they got turned off by therapy, over-therapized. Um, I've seen this with kids 8, 9, 10, 11 um, that have been in just – have shut down. Um, know what you're going to ask them before you ask it. Uh, damage ability to he hear, see, feel, and talk. Uh, trauma, things we've gone through in our lives, uh, damage our ability to um, communicate effectively. Uh, use as many more senses, because um, when you're in that action part of the cone of learning, you're using a lot more. Uh, it illustrates inner reality, so, you know, the reality that is, uh, you know, more real, but it's, that's real to you, not out in the reality that's not. Um, bypasses typical defenses. People start to do work and start getting the experience without even knowing they are. And honors different learning styles. Everybody learns based on their experiences in their life. And, you know, to, to try to figure out where everybody is, I've found that using experiential techniques get people into the work a lot, a lot sooner, a lot faster, and a lot more effective. Powerful, quick, incisive, efficient, and insightful. Equine therapy. Uh, when I say equine therapy, I talk about the model that I use, which is equine-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, the term equine therapy can have a, a number of uh, different uh, definitions. Um, I use the EGALA model. Um, EGALA uh, model is the Equine Assisted Growth and Learning Association. Um, and simply I put it solution-based. The ingredients, which are the uh, therapist who's focused on the uh, client and a horse handler who's focused on the behavior of the horses. And together, uh, they, make, they make through a therapeutic team, and we'll talk about their roles later. Uh, EAP is mostly groundwork with the horse, and the goal is not to learn horsemanship skills, which I have found has been a, a, a very um, – kind of, you know, myth when people think about equine therapy. You know, anybody that's been around a horse can, can naturally feel, you know, the power and the sensitivity and the energy um, that a horse puts out. But equine-assisted psychotherapy, it's not about riding. It's not about learning about horse handling. You know, you might learn about horse handling through your work, but it's uh, groundwork, and groundwork means non-mounted work, you know, on the ground. And the majority of exercises that I do, uh, the horses are unhaltered. So they can give authentic feedback um, and body language without you being able to uh, pull them towards you, you know. So it's a lot more, you know, authentic feedback. Uh, therapeutic writing, very useful. Um, you know, I do some of that. But when I talk about equine-assisted psychotherapy, 
I'm not talking about uh, therapeutic writing. That's a, a, a different thing. Uh, for resources, the Agala homepage, great resource. Uh, you can see a lot of people locally in your area. They have conferences. Fantastic. Um, equine assisted psychotherapy. Uh, I use that term. Agala also uses equine assisted learning, uh, network of professionals, um, types of interventions. Uh, a lot of research related to equine therapy where, as we find more and more, um, we're finding benef more beneficial research to equine therapy. Uh, and current ongoing programs working with the military, uh, working with military, working with clients with uh, PTSD from Afghanistan, Iraq, have uh, really shown as a challenging population for me personally to work with. And I have found that um, equine assisted psychotherapy has been a very, very useful relationship building tool with them. A solution based approach to therapy. Um, I use the term solution-based, kind of a combination between uh, uh, brief uh, solution-focused therapy. Uh, so that's just the thing I use. And uh, solution-focused brief therapy approach assumes clients have some knowledge of what, what would make their life better, kind of less like that humanistic theory that we talked about. Even though may, they, need, uh, they may need some help in describing the details of their life, that everyone who seeks help already possesses just a little bit to find their solutions. That's saying, you know, you know, and that really helps me identify my role. My role is to support this person to find their answer, not to tell them, not to, you know, not to direct them, but really support them and challenge them to do their own work. Uh, key concepts, looking for previous solutions, looking for exceptions, looking for people to put up roadblocks, maybe that's, uh, you know, denial, uh, repressed. Uh, present and future focused, so really trying to stay out of the, the past. You know, we can learn from the past, but really focus on, you know, what are we doing now and what direction are we moving in uh, in the future. Uh, compliments, part of that motivational interviewing, uh, empowerment. Uh, the miracle question, if you could or if this would happen, you know, what would your life be like uh, in coping questions. And I got that from the uh, that website. The role of the therapist, uh, to create and manage the space the therapeutic work is done in. So when, when I'm talking about using horses, um, you know, I recall that my role is to create and manage the space. I let the clients and the horse do the work. You know, my job is to manage the space. And so that takes a lot of trust and trust in the process. Observe the process of the clients. Um, you know, I do not, and I'll talk about this in safety, I do not interrupt the process. You know, I allow the process to work, uh, kind of with other experiential techniques, um, like a, a psychodrama. You know, my job is to, to start it and then let it, let it go where it goes. You know, I mean, I don't know what needs or what deserves to come up for somebody. So it's really um, remembering my role is to observe, observe the process. Uh, use clear, concise language to explain rules, expectation, and tasks. Uh, I try to use as few words but make them as clear as possible when I uh, explain tasks to people and uh, really not try to, you know, kind of talk too much. Do not, and I have that in uh, capitals, do the work for clients they deserve and figure out on their own. And even from the safety part, uh, I was talking to a student today I was talking about, you know, I grew up fearing horses because the only thing that was ever told to me is don't walk behind a horse, don't grab a horse too fast, don't do this, don't do that. And so it, it you know, I feel that don't, um, you know, it, it really kind of it restricts um, learning. You know, don't do this, don't do that, where the, you know, solution-focused and the Agala model in particular believes in allowing people to experience and learn from their own experience. So language-wise to me, I'm really always focused on not restricting someone's uh, you know, ability to learn their own stuff. And then empower the process of learning. Um, you know, usually more than anything else, people in the beginning of groups, clients will always look over to me, am I, you know, always with that, am I doing this right, am I doing this right? And, you know, as a, if my role is to empower, you know, I say, uh, my language would be, is it, is it right for you? Is it working, you know? If it's not working, what do you think you can do 
what changes can you make to make it to work? You know, I don't I don't have your answers. Okay. Horses as a co-therapist. Um, you know, just the phrase uh, horses as a co-therapist, but you know, really part of the uh the model and really I found out it makes it simpler um for me because when I'm facilitating sometimes I lose the ability to observe. So with the equine assisted psychotherapy model, you know, really I have that opportunity to step back and really kind of observe and see stuff that I wouldn't necessarily see, um, and I can see the whole picture. So using a horse and believing and trusting in the horse as the co-therapist. We got a picture of uh, Waylon, my thoroughbred up on the right. That's me um, with the horse on the bottom left at an Egala training. There's a little mini. All right. Why horses? Uh, masters of body language. So horses are so observant, um, and, the, and, the, and they pick up so uh, well on clients' body language. Non-judgmental. Horses, not right or wrong or good or bad. Uh, they don't care what you have on. You know, They want to know how you treat them, what kind of energy you're putting off to them. And they live in the present. They're not worried about, uh, you know, what happened yesterday. They're not worried about whether they're going to get paid <laughs> paid next week. They're really focused on what's going on in the present, which we know from, you know, very useful techniques such as mindfulness and meditation. It's that ability to really be present. So horses teach a lot. And they mirror the feelings of the clients, you know, not just uh, the body language, but horses are very intuitive on picking up, you know, anxiety and fear and uh you know and anger they're they're excellent uh they can pick up on feelings that we can't see you know so a lot of times being able to take myself out of the role of facilitator and be, be an observer i can observe with my equine specialist what the horse is kind of doing which gives me you know ways to understand what's really going on with the client but it's not, i might not be able to see in a, a, another therapeutic model and horses give immediate feedback connecting um, you know, the ability to connect is, uh, or the inability to connect is, you know, a, a big reason why people um, use ineffective coping skills, you know, substances or or anything. It's the inability, you know, connect. I know in the 12-step model they talk about uh, inability to connect with yourself and even uh, spiritually blocked off from the sunlight of the spirit. And so the ability to connect is something that we can do almost immediately uh, with horses, and uh, especially with uh, vets and vets that have experienced uh, traumatic stuff, you know, they have shown that they so much more quickly trust and connect um, with horses. Goals of equine therapy. Therapy team. So the therapy team would be the equine specialist and the therapist. So the equine specialist, his job is really observing the, the horses, and the, the therapist's job is to kind of observe everything but also observe how the, what, what the people are putting off. And during it, we withdraw ourselves from the, from, um, the, the process, and then we can kind of talk uh, amongst each other. Talk less, observe more. Empower clients to find their own solutions. Challenge clients to make letaf- metaphors to their life. A lot of that's done in the processing, but really challenge, uh, you know, is there, you know, I saw that today you were able to, uh, you know, found, you know, some techniques that didn't work for you, and you were able to keep changing until you find something that doesn't work. Is there anything going on in your life that can challenge you, you know? Process new solutions to life problems. So, you know, when you talk about hope and faith and things that you can't gauge, but, you know, for, for someone to see that, yeah, they can overcome an issue, they can, you know, work, they can be successful, and to be able to, you know, process that to stuff that's going on in your life. Connects with, connect with horses and others. So not just with just the horses, but also the team that they're working with if it's a group dynamic. And be creative to find solutions at work. I, I mean, I can do the same exercise in 10 different groups, and every group can come up with something new. You know, it's not, you know, and I really focus on it's not right or wrong or it's good or bad. You know, it either works to serve your needs 
or it doesn't, you know, and if it doesn't, what can you do to be more useful? And you learn from solutions that don't work and learn uh, from how you interact with horses. So being able to see in a mirror what that horse is picking up to give you, give you feedback. Uh, and here's some good stuff. So uh, in the, the next slide is, uh, you know, some pictures of this. Um, equine activity examples. Keep instructions basic and easy to understand. Uh, allow clients to process and interpret instructions. Safety guidelines, like I said, safety guidelines are very, very slim. You know, people, even people not around horses, you know, if given the opportunity, they can say, uh, they, they have the knowledge that, hey, maybe I shouldn't do this or maybe I, I shouldn't do that. Sometimes working with co-occurring disorder, you can have people at a, uh, you know, at a, at a rough kind of stage within their life, and that's the therapist's job to really assess if someone is safe to work in that environment. If somebody's, you know, very manic, uh, if somebody's definitely uh, still in a detox process, probably not the best person to, uh, you know, use in equine therapy because, you know, not only do the horses pick up on that, but there's something blocking off that relationship. So probably not the safest, uh, safest bet. Exercise can be as simple as observing herd dynamics, um, you know, feeding horses, understanding herd dynamics. Uh, there's a lot of research and theory into the relationship between herd dynamics and family dynamics. Uh, people can really pick up on that. Uh, or as simple as go stand next to the horse that you feel comfortable with and then allowing um, them to say why they feel comfortable with that horse. Uh, the selection ideas for activities is to provide a structure to help clients experience through horses and parallel to lives. One of the other things besides safety that was, was hard for me to understand with this is activities you create um, aren't you, you shouldn't have an expectation or a goal in mind. You know, this is to bring up boundaries in the family or this activity is to do this. You know, to really stay with the theory that, you know, my job is to present people with an opportunity to do work, you know, and really trust in the process is that if people get into doing work, creating relationships, what comes up is what deserves to come up. So not be so stuck on, you know, like a lesson plan, this is what I want to happen, this group, but are really kind of just rolling with it and allowing what to come up to come up. Uh, by trusting the process. You know, trusting the horses, trusting your partner, trusting the group, and trusting that humanistic core of people that, you know, if given the opportunity, they can come up with their own solutions. And uh, trusting the process allow horses and clients to take activities in directions that are prevalent in their lives. So what we have here is a, a couple pictures of a group I work with. And what I asked them to do at the beginning of this exercise, and it goes one, two, three from the left over to the right and down, um, it was create an obstacle course and have the horses go over it. That's it. That's all there was, obstacle course. I usually have a lot of tools in the arena, but when they started this, um, you know, somebody made the jumps really high. You know, horse wouldn't go over it. Um, and then, you know, it, it, it empowered some of the other people in the group to say, hey, can we make it lower? Can we make it lower? And, uh, you know, don't interact. Don't get in their process. They made it lower. They had it in the middle. They couldn't contain the horses. So I'm thinking about, you know, how am I going to process this when it's over, not interrupt it. But they created their own boundary with their, you know, themselves, the girls right there themselves, and used the fence. And then, you know, at the end, as you can see in the bottom, then they had a motor, you know, the energy about it. So when we processed it, you know, I just, I'll say something as simple as, what was that like? And they'll talk about, we didn't have a boundary. You know, are boundaries something that you struggle with? Well, yeah, you know. So all that stuff just comes up, you know, and I just be patient to allow it to come up. The next with some guys, um, they, uh, their exercise was make a jump and have the horse go over it. So throughout this process, and it took them about an hour, um, they made a jump all the way across the arena, as you can see there on the left, but once again couldn't contain the horses, you know. So then they kind of slid the jump over, and it's just constant, you know, thinking and talking to each other. And, you know, they get a lot of frustrated. People, you know, people leave, um, you know, and they were able to, you know, create that boundary of energy and uh, be able to do it. And so, like I said earlier, it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It either works to meet your needs or teaches you how to change and move forward. 
a couple metaphor examples, and metaphor examples are endless, you know. Uh, unable to keep horses contained would be boundaries. Frustration appears that horses do not comply with intended direction, maybe control. Uh, feel like horses or peers are not doing what you say. Um, inability to communicate. Horses continue to move away from you. Um, an opportunity to assess and mirror well, what's going on with you. What are you putting out that that horse is picking up where it continues to move away from you? And always allow clients uh, to present and process their metaphors. So when I say... Uh, the, you know the the horses they can't boundaries is what comes up for me you know it might ne not necessarily be what comes up for them there's a good chance it's what you know what's going to come up for them but whatever they talk about you know really empower them to talk about what what comes up for them benefits of equine therapy um, these are just some of the possible ones conquer fear self -co self confidence uh, Awareness of body language, boundaries, self-acceptance, trust, uh, feel freedom. And, you know, the freedom comes from, I think, is not putting such a, uh, you know, a tight rein on, you know, this is what you're going to do, this is what you're not going to do. You know, do whatever works. Uh, a change in, change in perspective, uh, reduce anxiety, communication, and spiritual growth. You know, a lot of that stuff, as someone who's really struggling from co-occurring disorder, you know, not a lot of those are something that they're really going to embrace. Uh, integration with other therapeutic models. So, you know, how can I make this beneficial time, you know, congruent with what else is going on in their, you know, kind of therapeutic plan? Exercises can be created and metaphors can be used in processing activities to incorporate other therapeutic models. So, um, you know, talking about, you know, 12-step, talking about, you know, mindfulness, um, talking about meditation, you know, talking about, you know, bilateral stimulation, you know, talking about some of the other stuff that they have, you know, going on, you know, throughout their day if you're working in uh, residential therapy that really kind of, you know, fires stuff off for them so they can use these metaphors in other areas of their life. Uh, mindfulness, meditation, bilateral stimulation, creating solutions when you think about um, solution-focused therapy and behavior modification, you know, making that, uh, you know, adaption of, yeah, you can, you know, modify your behavior. Even if you've been doing it your whole life, it's possible, you know, and that's what they learn is the, the possibilities of being able to do that stuff. Uh, learning and finding new processing with cognitive restructuring and uh, examining conscious and subconscious behavior. So, uh, you know, Learning and doing things that they do without even without even thinking. Collaboration with other professionals. I love when um, other you know they're they're ongoing. Say if I'm just doing groups you know once a week with somebody, if their therapist comes and comes too, because I can get so much insight, and they can get so much insight to be able to use you know what they're observing with the client later down the road. You know. Oh, you know, I noticed, you know, in the next day in group, hey, I noticed that you were doing this last week or, you know, I saw, tell me about, you know, how you're doing that with the horses. But, you know, not just saying, hey, you know, today was great or, you know, Wednesdays, Wednesdays at 2 we have equine therapy, but really using that um, as a bridge to, you know, other areas. Uh, and other professionals can bring different perspectives. Can take their observations with them. Um, and, you know, and also we know that, you know, even though it's, uh, you know, remembering that, you know, you know, kind of the boundaries and what we've been through in our life, but using that real life experience uh, is, is, you know, everybody brings a different life experience and having other professionals um, bring that. And getting close to wrapping up, you know, I just, um, you know, I put the slide in almost every presentation I do. Uh, contact with horses will, will change your life. Um, there's so much we can learn um, from their just uh, you know their affect and the way that the way they respond to us. So these are uh, questions that I I pose and I'll just read through them real quick. Um, I'm interested in how you use uh, experiential techniques or experiential equine currently. Um, goals for the future. What has worked or what doesn't work. Uh, what you would like to know, and what are your local resources. And then we have the poll question again. 
Um, so if you want to take a, uh, a couple seconds, you know, maybe you pick something up. Hopefully everybody doesn't learn less, uh, if that's possible. But just, you know, keep a, a few minutes or a few seconds and kind of put, if you feel like you have a, a greater knowledge. All right. Okay. So a little bit, you know. Uh, room for growth, but it looks like everybody is, uh, you know, learning a little bit. So uh, I do like that. And then love this quote, and this is uh, this is good for experiential therapy in general, but definitely for equine. When I hear something, I forget. When I see something, I remember. When I do something, I understand. And you know, I know for me, uh, you know, my goal is helping people understand and learn so they can make better decisions for themselves in the future. Uh, I have a couple references. If you want to look at those, um, you can, you know, log back in and look at those. And then I'm going to give it back over to uh, Gary, I do believe. Patrick, thank you very much. Outstanding job. Um, we do have some questions that have come in from the audience. Of course, we would like to remind everyone in the audience that you can still use the Q&A widget below the slides on your screen to submit a question. Uh, we'll try to get through as many questions as possible in uh, the remaining time today. Uh, I'm going to reward the first person who submitted a question uh, uh, since they were very prompt and I thought they had a very interesting question about their experience. Uh, They've been delivering the EGALA model services for 10 years, this, this uh, person, and says we believe in the benefit fully and see the positive impact daily. Uh, our biggest hurdle, however, we face is the industry asking for evidence-based models. How do you handle that? Uh, what kind of research is available uh, to, to document that? So, and it's hard, and I know that, you know, um, where I work, uh, you know, the state I work in, um, have struggled with, you know, insurance and, you know, looking at evidence-based stuff. I think as a, uh, you know, psychology, as a, as a culture, you know, we're moving to, you know, appreciating more of that qualitative research. But, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, people like to see statistics and graphs and that quantitative uh, research. And, you know, actually on the EGALA website, or if you want to email me, I've got some, uh, some pretty good, uh, you know, quantitative, uh, you know, data. But what I would, um, you know, challenge people to do is really, you know, find some local resources and, you know, really start doing some of your own, you know, and, and find some, you know, some interns or a local college because we truly need more research in this field, um, you know, because there's, a, you know, a lot of people that have to see, um, have to see the numbers um, for it to work. So, like I said, uh, shoot me an email or, um, you know, I've got some uh, resources on my website and, uh, you know, I'll do the best I can to get you some stuff. Excellent. Um, Patrick, we have a, a person who asked, do you work with a wide variety of ages in this, in this uh, form of therapy? Yes. Um, you, know, you know, most definitely. And, you know, the, uh, the, the best part is, you know, typically I work with um, 18 and older, um, but I have done, you know, some, some nonprofit and, uh, you know, workshops with, with younger and it is so useful, you know. Um, and so I really have to train myself to not think, you know, how is this going to work, how is this going to respond, but really trust in the process is that if I can get people out there, you know, with the horses um, and take a step back, that, uh, you know, they'll be able to come up with their own solutions and their own metaphors. Um, interesting question that came in here. Have you observed differences in experiences with equine therapy between individuals with drug or alcohol addictions versus individuals who have addictions such as eating disorders and self-harm? Any thoughts on that, Patrick? Yeah, um, you know, most definitely. And also, you know, when you kind of, you know, make, um, I know with eating disorders, sometimes, um, you know, I will do activities that surround um, feed or food, you know, uh, or, you know, you know or, or substances, and, you know, I do things, I just make stuff up called, like, addiction alley, you know. So sometimes I tailor generally um, to the group, you know, without looking at what I, what, what, what I want people to say or what comes up, but kind of tailor it generally to the group, you know, especially if I have an eating disorder or that. But, you know, 
really, uh, when, it, when it comes down to it, what's going on with somebody on the inside is what's going to come up. And, you know, a lot of times I have found that, you know, I'll get people in groups and they're saying, uh, you know, their primary is uh, eating or their primary is um, substances. And then when I get them out there and, you know, and, and embrace this kind of solution, uh, you know, solution-focused stuff, a lot of different stuff comes up. You know, the the stuff that, you know, as a therapist that you really need to be able to work on, uh, and it's not really as much the behavior, but, you know, it's the the useful stuff that you can work on, the core stuff. Um, Excellent. Um, Patrick, question that came in uh, sort of about the basics of of maybe getting started with something like this. Uh, They ask, what's the best way to get started with putting equine therapy to use in an already established office practice? Any any thoughts about what the the first steps would be there? Um. When I looked at equine therapy and, you know, I was starting a private practice, I was looking at, you know, how can I give services to people that don't have them? So, you know, I offer services on a mobile basis. And, um, you know, in town uh, people can come to me uh, where I have resources. You know, but also I've used, uh, you know, a mobile arena. You know, I know, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, office and and stuff like that, people don't have those resources. But – if I get um, if I get a call from someone at a facility that you know is out of town and even farther from where I can trailer, I'll network with a local barn, um, you know, a, a local horse facility, and then get insurance on it, and then you know have them bring the clients there. So you know, really, it doesn't have to be your own place. And I would really challenge people on you know the type of horses to use. You know, horses have an inherent kind of uh, feel for this kind of work. You know, so after using horses a little bit, you know, besides like an unbroken Mustang, you know, um, you know, it, it's not so much, you know, the the kind of horse that you use. It's just, you know, being able to manage the space. Someone asked, um, how do you handle it when clients say they would like to focus on learning to ride, um, to learning to ride the horse? Is that an issue that comes up? And and how would you how would you address that if it did? So every time, so um, as soon as we sit down and as soon as we process, um, that's going to be the first thing I say, hey, um, you know, I love to ride. You know, I grew up riding some, but riding is not what we do here, okay? If riding is something you're interested in, you know, I'd be happy to talk to, you know, you or your therapist or, you know, the program person to find you some resources. But, um, you know, we don't do mounted work here. So right out of the gate, um, I make that clear and set that boundary. And Patrick, I'm curious, um, are there any liability or other kinds of logistical issues like that that a treatment center or a uh, practitioner would have to be concerned about in any way in terms of uh, integrating this into what they do? Uh, Most definitely. So you're really going to need to, um, you know, I know you get a lot of pages when we get insurance, but um, your professional liability um, will not solely cover you for this. So there's a difference between groundwork and mounted work. And, uh, you know, in equine uh, insurance, uh, Carrie will be able to tell you the difference. But insurance-wise, you know, being insured to do groundwork is less of a liability than riding work, obviously, because you can fall off if you're riding. But I carry professional liability, but I also carry uh, equine liability for equine-assisted psychotherapy. So, um, you know, never had a claim, never had an injury, never had an issue. But, you know, and you can also get a policy where, um, you know, I can add or take off wherever I'm going and wherever I'm working. You know, if I'm working in Memphis, I can add that facility and that address there, or I can take it off. So, you know, definitely talk to your insurance carrier, but, you know, typically uh, just a professional liability insurance will not cover you, um, you know, from if there's an incident with a horse involved. Excellent. Um Patrick, um, actually someone asked about, is there any access uh, to any kind of a list of horse owners that are willing to participate in in this kind of thing? Uh, This person actually is in New Jersey in an area affected by Hurricane Sandy, but but, I guess more generically, is there some kind of access to, you know, being able to find out, you know, where someone may be able to uh, work with you on this? So, um I always use, um, because I've got to find new areas all the time, I'll use uh, first the Agala website um, to see if there's anybody practicing Agala that I can, you know, look at. But then, um, you know, I'm I'm doing the footwork and I'm looking in the horse world. So a Google search, I'm looking at uh, riding. And then, you know, if 
if you know if I know somebody that offers rides and trail rides, and there's a good chance that they have a you know arena, they deal with a you know a bunch of people. But then what I have to do is I have to explain what I do to them, you know. So uh, usually um, I'm looking for places that you know. So I'm not looking at show barns. You know, because usually they're too busy, and people that board, you know, always want access. So I'm looking at barns that aren't as busy, um, you know, and I really don't use, you know, horses that are very kind of overtrained to show and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm as useful to use um, because just the horses themselves carry so much anxiety. Um, so, you know, I'm looking for kind of a, a mid level barn. And, you know, so I'll do a Google search, and I'll just call, and I'll go out there, and I'll, you know, I'll explain to them what I do, um, you know, talk about insurance, and we'll negotiate a, a fair price, and then, you know, it usually starts a great relationship. And, and I think we'll wrap up with this question, uh, Patrick. Uh, again, kind of a logistical question. How big of a space arena is recommended for this kind of work? So depending on the, uh, depending on the group size, um, I really like to keep my group sizes from um, 8 to 12, but, um, you know, you can separate it into two groups. So, you know, anywhere from a, um, kind of 60 by 80, 80 by 100, um, you, you want spaces for the horses to move and run um, if they want and move around for people have to move. But, uh, you know, you can also do things like – I've got a, the, the pictures, I've got a big, um, one I use in Memphis is a big indoor arena, and I block about half of it off, you know, because it's too big. So, you know, if, you know, if, if as long as you have something that contains them, you know, when I do my mobile arena, I'm about 60, 60 by 80, um, you'll be good. Excellent. Patrick, thanks so much. I think the knowledge level, even with the Q&A, has, has really increased on this topic, and I think people are very engaged on it clearly from these questions, and, and thanks very much. Um, we're going to wrap up with some final instructions regarding CE credit. At this time, please click on the green CE certificate button located at the bottom of your screen to generate your CE certificate for this event. Please save the certificate to your hard drive first before printing. Please note that you must have viewed today's entire program to qualify for a CE certificate. Should you have any other questions or issues regarding CE certificates, please click the Contact CE Help Desk button at the bottom of your screen to email our help desk. You can also reach this desk at info at vendomegrp.com. As a registrant of today's event, you will receive an email in the next 24 hours, which will provide on-demand access to an archived recording of this presentation for up to one year from today's date to share with colleagues. Also, if you enjoyed today's program, we invite you and our audience to view a list of upcoming webinars and to join our community discussion through our Facebook and LinkedIn groups through the links featured in today's resource list. I want to thank Patrick Dunn once again for an excellent presentation today. I also would like to thank our sponsor, Foundations Recovery Network, for making today's program possible. Finally, my thanks to you and our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another Addiction Professional webinar. This concludes today's presentation.